So the FDA just released some new recommendations about amalgam fillings. We're gonna talk about what that means right now. Welcome back, it's great to see everybody again. If you're new here, my name is Adam and this channel is all about my first few years in clinical practice and kind of a backstage look into dentistry and the dental profession. If you haven't seen it yet, the FDA just came out with some new recommendations for amalgam fillings for the dental industry. And if you're not in the United States, the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration. That's the government agency that's responsible for the safety of food and medical devices and drugs. And that includes everything that we use in dentistry. So the fact that they actually issued a new recommendation about amalgam is, is kind of a big deal, at least in the United States. At the end of September, the FDA came out with a recommendation that basically said amalgam fillings are safe in general and they work well. But there are some people that should not have amalgam fillings done if possible. One thing to keep in mind with these recommendations is that there is not any new science or no new research that this is based on. All of the research we have on amalgam, and it goes back pretty far, says basically the same thing. We are exposed to mercury just, just by living on the planet Earth through the food we eat and industrial contamination, things like that. We're all going to have a little bit of mercury exposure. And if you take you know blood measurements, you'll probably have some mercury in your bloodstream. If you have amalgam fillings in your mouth, you're probably on average going to have a little bit more of an exposure to mercury. And the research does bear that out. So people that say that amalgams raise your blood levels of mercury, they definitely do. But what the science has told us is that small amount that you're exposed to in fillings is way under the threshold of something that would be clinically significant or cause any sort of problem. And that's pretty much the position that the ADA has taken, that we have researched this extensively and amalgam is, is safe. But the new recommendations are saying that there are some people who should avoid dental amalgams. I'm gonna put a link to everything down in the description and I'm gonna put that up on the screen right now. Basically, the FDA is, is making it pretty clear that they would recommend in these patients that we use another restorative material than amalgam. So let me know down in the comments what you guys think this means for the future of dentistry. Because to me, when I read this the first time, I, I was honestly a little bit surprised. There's no new science. I know amalgam is pretty safe. We went through all of this in dental school. So to have this new recommendation was, was a little bit weird. But the more I dug into it, a lot of other countries have similar recommendations. For example, in the European Union, they have even more aggressive recommendations than this. But what happens is the media tends to sensationalize these things. So when these recommendations came out, we had a whole bunch of news stories that also came out. So most patients, I know my patients will be, and your patients probably will too, they're gonna be up on this stuff. So they might ask questions if you want a treatment plan and amalgam versus a composite. It's amazing to me how much things have changed over even 10 years. I graduated in 2011, and when I was in dental school, I did not place a single posterior composite. Everything was amalgam. And then when I got into private practice, it was exactly the opposite. The dentist before me almost never used amalgam, and so if I treatment planned one, I had to explain it to a patient. And I learned pretty quick that these patients expected composites, and so I had to learn to get pretty good at composites. And depending on your patient population, you're probably going to run into the same thing. And if not right now, I bet, you know, as the years go on, people are gonna be less and less receptive to amalgam fillings. And that's not a judgment call on my part. I'm not saying it should be that way or it shouldn't be that way. It's just, it's realistic and we do have alternatives. Like I said before, my go-to filling for any tooth is a composite, including back teeth. And I would still use amalgams maybe five or 10 times a year for situations where I couldn't keep something dry. But say you don't want to use amalgam at all, and I'm not telling you to do that because you know you have to do what is best for your practice and especially your patient. So if a patient is absolutely demanding or you run into a situation where you just don't feel good placing an amalgam, what do you do instead? Well, obviously composite is, is pretty much a go-to now for posterior restorations. There's really no way getting around it. I think any dentist now has to be pretty good at placing posterior composites. There is definitely more of a learning curve. You have to be more meticulous with isolation. But once you get your workflow down and you have that confidence in your ability, I can place as good a composite now as an amalgam. I, I can guarantee that because I've seen it. I look at the composites that I've placed five years ago and then compare that to the amalgams that I placed five years ago. 
honestly, my composites look a little bit better than the amalgams. And I know the research says amalgam lasts longer, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I don't want to discount that, but if you get a good protocol down, you can place a great composite restoration that, that will last and be a good service to that patient. So in 95% of circumstances, I can place a good composite, but what about that 5% where I would normally love to use an amalgam, but the patient says, no way, we're not doing an amalgam. I think one of the best kept secrets in dentistry is, is glass ionomer. Honestly, Fuji 9 is my go-to filling for an occlusal restoration that's hard to isolate. I love using this in a situation like a partially erupted second molar that already has caries. Fuji 9 is perfect. And in all my years of placing this, I honestly can't think of one instance where I have had an occlusal glass ionomer fail either due to wear or recurrent decay. Now, anecdotally, these can wash out over time, but I have not seen that as an issue. The ones that I've placed even years down the road are still looking fantastic. On the other hand, glass ionomer is not appropriate for a class two restoration. And I don't care what the manufacturer says, if you place a class two glass ionomer, that's in occlusion, the marginal ridge is eventually going to fail. This material is not strong enough to hold up to biting forces when you use it that way. So what do you do? Say you have some really deep proximal caries and the patient just will not tolerate amalgam. I actually use this trick fairly often, maybe once a month, something like that. I'll do what's called an open sandwich technique. And so what I'll do is on the deepest part of that box where I know I can't get great isolation, I'll place the glass ionomer. And then on top of that, I'll place a composite. There is a little bit of an extra workflow there because you have to place basically two fillings, but you can get really great results with this. And again, I know there are anecdotes of this material washing out over time, but I just haven't seen that as an issue. And I feel pretty good about placing these after having done quite a few of them. So this is just my workflow. I kind of naturally pivoted away from amalgam just by finding new materials and techniques that I liked better. But if you're somebody that really likes amalgam and you can do these great amalgam fillings, there's nothing in these guidelines that says you can't keep doing that kind of dentistry. I would just say you'd probably want to be aware of the news that's out there so that you're ready to have conversations with patients. And then just kind of know that once in a while, you'll probably get one of those patients that you just cannot talk into an amalgam. So it's a good idea to have some alternative techniques sort of in your back pocket. As always, please like, subscribe, share, and I will see you guys next time.